Hey, and welcome to this episode of Top 5, The Weird and Mysterious. If you're new to this channel, welcome. We do a lot of live shows that take place right here every single week, so make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to set for notifications. Hello to everyone in the live chat today. We have Deranged, Chris, Welcome Everyone, Optic, Sever, Cassidy, um, John Aside, Zoltan, Jessica, welcome everyone. A part of our planet that is mostly inaccessible, always inhospitable, and steeped in strange mysteries and tales of the bizarre is Antarctica. In this episode of Top 5, we will look into these into the strangest rumors concerning the continent. Joining me today is host of Creepy Little Book, Pete McCarthy. Pete, my friend, how's it going? How do you do, Christina? It's so great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. When it comes to this topic, you are the man to call. <laughs> well, I have spent some time on it. Just, just a tad. No, you've, you've, you've done some really interesting research on this. Now, the things that we're going to be covering today are rumors. So this is things that people have kind of talked about behind closed doors. There's been some articles written about it. But for a lot of these topics, there isn't really a lot of hardcore science backing it up, um, which is going to be really interesting to talk about, because even though it's still considered a rumor, um, these are the kind of stories that we still need to talk about and be knowledgeable in so that if someone were to bring in this conversation, we'd be ready, right? Um, mm. I would quickly like to mention that for those that need help, falling asleep, if you have insomnia like myself, meditating, relaxing, studying, and so on, check out my music channel at Cosmic portals on youtube that will help you do exactly that and let me just tell you i just posted a new track called dune vibes from the movie dune obviously and uh you know what i, I thought it was thought it was pretty good so take a look nice. at that when you get a chance that those links are below and all of pete's links are below in the description box as well so pete let's kind of start off with the third man factor what Alrighty. is this so uh, when Ernest Shackleton wrote his 1919 book, South, he described his belief that there was this incorporeal companion that joined he and his men during the final leg of their Antarctic journey. When he wrote about this, this would inspire other adventurers to come forward and explain they had experienced similar things. It's always called the third man factor because there was a, a poem called The Wasteland that gave name to the phenomenon but it can happen to one person alone you know you could be out there lost in the wilderness and all of a sudden this incorporeal companions there to kind of uh give you the strength to endure and to push on right and now there's been a lot of people that have been to antarctica that have had this phenomenon happen to them and then there were some scientists in sweden that said no we we understand the phenomenon we get it it's nothing supernatural at all but actually what it turns out is this kind of time delay so scientists in switzerland st developed a device that allowed a healthy human as a test subject and to draw a pattern that was then replicated to the subjects back with the slight time delay. The scientists determined that the delay between the subject's movement and the mirrored pattern caused the subject to misidentify the source of sensory and motor input essentially. And it caused a disconnect between the body position and senses to create this eerie feeling of a ghost in the room. And it was so powerful for some of these subjects that they just refused to continue the test. But that doesn't really explain all of the things that, or all of the explanations that happened to some people that encountered the third man factor. What would be some exceptions to this? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm always a little skeptical of whatever mainstream science says. So in this regard, I have to say there might be a spiritual component to it. You know, we hear stories of guardian angels or perhaps maybe uh, elemental spirits, ultra-terrestrials. You know, the possibility exists that it could be something else out there 
that these people are encountering that has more of a, a spiritual side to it. You know, even Shackleton described them as being incorporeal. They didn't possess bodies. And uh, only spiritual beings I know of exist with a level of intelligence and uh, incorporeality. Can you explain from your research what kind of spiritual entities kind of fit this this topic? Well, first and foremost, the idea of a guardian angel would be what comes to mind right away. Uh, but I've been steeped in religious studies for a while now. So I, I, I think that that's something I would lean toward. It's going to make sense based on my recent research. But it really seems to me that, uh, you know, the possibility exists that these people under these extreme conditions, uh, when life and limb is at stake, may have encountered an angel that, in, you know, uh, gave them the courage and strength to endure just a little bit more to reach their goal. Well, what's interesting about the third man factor is that visions that appeared to people were both men and women and sometimes even a particular person like a dead spouse, a parent or a friend. And these visions often spoke to the people that were in distress, providing them comfort advice or simply company and in most cases the presence disappeared again just before helped arrived um which we can kind of look at this from an aspect of is it really our loved ones is it potentially a spiritual entity taking the form of someone that we can relate to that we can actually listen to and then it makes you question why do they want to help us have it be someone that we know or someone that we don't? And why is it happening more in Antarctica than other locations? Yeah, it really only happens in, in really extreme conditions. So you'll right. see people perhaps shipwrecked that will experience the third man factor or mountain climbers. But Antarctica seems to be the place where this really originated. You know, I mean, Shackleton being the first to come forward and say so. Uh, so, uh, with a land of such mystery, one can only assume what's actually going on down there. And this uh, Shackleton uh, kind of gave out this information, I think it was in 1916, right? So, like, in the early 1900s, when this information and uh, this phenomenon was kind of taking legs of its own, I guess you could say, where it was hitting the books, hitting somewhat of the mainstream for those that were researching in Antarctica and other um, locations where you were almost going to have, in a sense, a near-death experience. And if we kind of touch on near-death experiences, we've heard of conversations like these. We've heard of these details where a loved one will come and visit you and state, it's not your time to go. You're not ready. You've heard that. Yeah, it, it's part and parcel an element of these kind of near-death experiences people have when they come close to the threshold and, and they have these encounters where it's deceased relatives or angelic beings or even deity in some cases. Uh, one famous case that comes to mind was that of Howard Storm who actually had a very negative near-death experience. And, uh, you know, I guess that's a story for another time. No, 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 but, share it, share it. No, I want to yeah. hear it, Pete, please. Uh, Howard Storm, uh, he died and went to hell. Uh, he was uh, an atheist who was also an artist and a college professor. And in the 1980s, he went on a weeks-long journey to Europe because he was an up-and-coming artist, and he had a few gallery showings within the continent. So he was in France, and he uh, ended up getting what was called a pierced duodenum, where essentially a hole ruptures in your intestinal tract, and stomach acid starts to leak into your body. Now, the average life expectancy for this is something like five hours, but he endured eight hours with no medication in a French hospital because the doctor went home being tired, I guess. Uh, essentially, what happens to him is uh, he wakes up, and he's not in pain anymore. But he can't reconcile why there's this thing in the bed that looks just like him that he first assumed was a wax figure. And then he tried to talk to his wife, but she couldn't hear him. He tried to talk to the guy that was in the room sharing the room with him. You know, uh, and then voices started beckoning him to come out into the hallway. And as he followed these voices who promised to make him get better, the hallway got darker. The environment got colder until he found himself surrounded by thousands of beings that had once had been people, but now had become something else. 
Uh, without getting too vulgar, they did everything imaginable to this person you'd expect happening in hell, but something in his mind told him to call out, you know, the name of Christ. Then, uh, you know, angels descended, pulled him up from the darkness. He was made whole once again, and then the doctors revived him. Uh, and then he turned around and became like a Protestant minister. Uh, I think he wrote a book as well, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, his name's Howard Storm. You can find all kinds of footage of him. He's been uh, on all kinds of television shows. Oprah uh, being probably the most uh, popular one he was on. Yeah, but that that was Howard Storm, you know. So, uh, you know, with this kind of idea of a spiritual realm existing, and I firmly believe there is a spiritual component to our world, it's... I'm hard pressed to kind of dismiss Shackleton's experience or any of these other people who have gone through the third man factor as something simply dismissible by science or hallucination. I think there's, there's something more to it. Oh my gosh. That is interesting. And a story that I haven't heard before deranged. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. It says, Pete, where are you keeping the purple track suit? <laughs> deranged. I only have a blue track suit. I have not purchased a purple one yet. For for those that aren't familiar with your channel, Creepy Little Book, mm. just briefly tell us this uh, interest in the tracksuit. Uh, you know, I, I kind of it started as a joke that I was going to get a tracksuit. I I I, uh, I always wanted a velour tracksuit for some reason. Uh, so I kept joking about it, joking about it. The people started super chat, and now I have to get it. So uh, yes, I am the proud owner of a velour and lime green tracksuit. Yeah, it's electric electric blue and lime green. Yeah, it's got some piping on it. Uh, yeah, very comfortable. Very comfortable. I highly recommend them. <laughs> they're they're a bit noisy, but I guess they must be very comfortable. No, um, no, that's corduroy. That's corduroy. This is velour. Oh, got you. Got you. Okay. Yeah, so it's very, very comfortable. No, no noise at all. Rock on. Jimmy is watching this from Denmark. It is super early in the morning there. Ooh. Welcome. And... Just an awesome Viking music channel as well. Dan Heem, love it so much. So welcome for being welcome for being here. And thank you for being here as well. So another topic that caught my interest, caught your interest, is the Ark of Gabriel. Now, we're all decently familiar in the Ark of the Covenant. But when it comes to this one, I was like, you know, I've very briefly have heard it, but not enough to be like, yep, I, I can write a whole page paper on this. <laughs> um, so I did a lot of research into this, a lot of research back when this happened. I was fascinated by it because, uh, like you said, people have heard of the Ark of the Covenant. What is this Ark of Gabriel thing? Well, essentially, how the story goes back in 2015, underneath the uh, Kaaba in Mecca, they were doing some excavations and they uncovered the this box that released a plasma discharge, killing most of the workers who had come across the item. After this, holy men were sent in, along with other uh, workers and scientists, to try to retrieve the box. Uh, this resulted in a crane collapse uh, after another electrical discharge that killed uh, dozens of people. Oh, yes. we're looking at right here the crane collapse yeah the crane collapse it killed dozens of people yeah this this took place in um 2015 september 11th and it this crane killed 107 people including the construction crew and the rumor was that the construction crew had discovered the ark of gabriel and then it was they were killed by a plasma emission now here's where it gets wild less than two weeks later on september 24th an estimated four thousand worshipers were killed in what was officially called a stampede and unofficially called another plasma emission emission linked to the ark now did you hear about this in the news back in 2015 uh, this was all over the place in 2015. This had set the uh, world of the fringe on fire. Like, everybody was talking really? about Really? It. it was such a hot-button thing. Uh, it went hand-in-hand hand with the reports in Antarctica. Like, all of it kind of, it was like dominoes falling over. It was just story after story coming out of the frozen continent. And uh, and I was right there on top of everything to try and discern what was going on. So from from about the time period of the Ark of Gabriel story uh, to some of the troop movements that were going on down there with uh, 
well, I don't even want to get into that. Uh, but uh, some of the other stuff that I uh, had investigated, uh, it was just really popping off down there. And there's been a lot of silence ever since. I've seen some strange stories pop up here and there. Uh, purported discovery of uh, some research tape that showed monsters moving around in the snow. But uh, I just didn't buy it. It looked like some CGI to me. So uh, it's been quiet on that front. And how is this Ark of Gabriel connected to Antarctica? Okay, so the Ark of Gabriel, after this uh, horrible accident, the uh, the government decides to call for help. And uh, Russia sends a ship down to Jeddah, the, the port of Jeddah, to pick up this object and take it to Antarctica. Now, prior to this happening, there was uh, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, uh, I believe his name is Patriarch Kirill, had met with Pope Francis in Havana, Cuba, where purportedly the Pope provided the Patriarch with an ancient manuscript purportedly written in a Nakian script, the writing of the angels, to take and do some kind of ritual over this object once it reached Antarctica. Now, some of the stories said that the church it was being taken to was the only church on the continent, that isn't so. It's the only Russian Orthodox Church on the continent. But there are others. So uh, so let that be known. There are a few other churches on there. I did a lot of research into where the Ark Gabriel came from, though. Did it ever exist? Where it been? What part of the world? What is this thing? And the best reference I found came uh, from the 9th century Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is a fascinating country. Fascinating history. Crossroads of the world. Uh, great Christian kingdom in the ancient times. And that's where I found mention of the Ark of Gabriel. Uh, there's actually a church built on the site that I believe the Ark was originally housed. But when the kingdom was invaded, the Ark was hidden on a series of islands. Now, I believe at some point it was finally found in Ethiopia and then carried back to Mecca. But... I couldn't find any evidence of when that occurred, only around when it might have happened. And just backing up a little bit to the um, those that had died back in 2015 after this mm. whole issue in Mecca, um, were, were there um, autopsies or anything like that made public? Like, could, could you have got that through FOIA of some kind or was or what was an explanation for their cause of death um being the the first one that took place September 11th 2015 you know they they never released that information there was never a full release of how many died or how they were killed you know i'm sure they kind of dismissed it as some kind of industrial accident they were digging underground you know something could have gone wrong in any regard but, uh, you know, we're dealing with the, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia at the end of the day, right? So they're not really going to be forthcoming with, uh, with anything of that nature to, uh, to especially a country that's not really one of their allies. I, I don't think there's any kind of FOIA request in that country. Mm. And as for the Russian Catholic Orthodox Pope going to see Pope Francis and then they, they kind of switched manuscripts over – the the Russian Pope went straight to Antarctica afterward. Oh, immediately. Immediately down to Antarctica. Uh, and purportedly, he said whatever blessing needed to be said over this object, did whatever ritual was required, and then it was taken by Russian commandos into the interior of the continent to be disposed of. Disposed of. Well, if this item is a holy item given to Prophet Muhammad... Uh, by Archangel Gabriel, how would a human, if if anything, right, would be able to destroy something like this? Or do you think maybe it was just buried? It's likely it was buried, I think. Okay. If you really wanted to hide something, if you really needed to bury something like that, Antarctica is the place to do it. And why? Com compared to any other continent, why would Antarctica be the place? It's so inhospitable. It's, uh, you know, it's the world's largest desert. It's uh, it's isolated. It's uninhabited. It's the last frontier. Jeez, and you're you're absolutely right. So, how is this ark different from the ark of the covenant, from your knowledge? Well, I believe this ark contained a manuscript that was believed to be written by the angels as well, fallen angels, no less. 
but uh, this art contained a manuscript. That's as far as I know. I don't know if that's true or not, but those were the rumors that were circulating around the time. And for this kind of information, how do you think it was made public? Do you think it's just simply a rumor that was created for fun, or do you think that there could poten potentially be some truth behind this? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. There's so much going on at once that it's really hard to think it was all coincidence. Very hard to think it was all coincidence. Just too many of the dots kept lining up as the events were unfolding. You know, because at the time this was happening in real time, it was like this accident occurred and then the Ark of Gabriel story comes up and then all of a sudden popes are meeting patriarchs and Russia is sending boats to Saudi Arabia and then they're in the same boats going to Antarctica. It's just very strange. And then the patriarchs go into Antarctica. Then Buzz Aldrin's down in Antarctica. Then John Kerry's down in Antarctica. Then they're finding pyramids in Antarctica. You mentioned Buzz Aldrin. Why yeah. him out of all people? Why would he be in, in, in Antarctica? And just very briefly, for those that do not know, tell us who Buzz Aldrin is. Oh, the astronaut. Come on, everybody. Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> Well, you know, I have so many new viewers and listeners though, that are in high school and in college. And you know what? They're not taught this information in school. Really? We talk my, about people my, like Buzz Aldrin. So. My viewers are generally a little bit older than that. I don't have a lot of young viewers. So uh, I'm usually playing catch up with them. <laughs> <laughs> so so tell us, um, why was he there? I don't know what he was doing there. Uh, Antarctic tourism might have been. Uh, publicity. I don't know why he necessarily needs publicity. I mean, he's an American hero. Yeah, exactly. But uh, but he was down there, and uh, he fell ill. And then there was a tweet, allegedly, that said it's pure evil. And there was a photograph of an Antarctic pyramid. Now, I did research into the tweet. It looks like it might have been uh, doctored. Not a real tweet from Buzz Aldrin. But uh, nevertheless, he was down there, and he got sick. Something yeah, was going on. That Why is an 83-year-old man down in Antarctica? Exactly. Especially when you're dealing with an inhospitable environment. That's the desert. It is the biggest desert yeah. on the planet. And it, yes, it's ice, sure. But like it is drier than a bone there. Mm -hmm. And why would someone of that age go there where you would know that your health would be at risk? It would have to be so significant for him to go there. And that goes for anybody, Absolutely. really. You know, who knows? There's so many stories of swirl around Buzz Aldrin, the moonshot. Who knows what they contacted when they were up there? Uh, maybe Buzz Aldrin is some kind of ambassador to uh, uh, to some other intelligence. You know, maybe uh, maybe they sent him down there because he's the only one they'd be willing to talk to. Well, that's an interesting theory and one that I have never heard of before. I like it. But something else that is pretty unique and interesting when it comes to Antarctica is the theory of hollow earth. Now, you, oh, you yeah. either love this topic or you think it's absolute nonsense and there's no point in covering it. But we're, we're talking about all the rumors and all the strangeness when it comes to Antarctica. And this, this interest in hollow earth actually started in the 1600s, but it wasn't until Admiral Byrd came into the story in about 1925 was when people were kind of biting their teeth into this theory. Tell us about it. So initially, the uh, hollow earth theory had been around, just as I mentioned. There was a man in the 1880s named John Cleve Sims Jr., and John Cleve Sims Jr. had first uh, proposed that there were openings at the poles. So he created globes that had huge openings at the poles. And he went around on lecture tours and he wrote letters to every president, prime minister, and senator he could, requesting money to go on an expedition to the South Pole so he could find the entrance to the Hollow Earth. Now, ultimately, he was unsuccessful in raising the funds, but his contribution to Hollow Earth lore is fundamental at this point, with many believing that the Antarctic is nothing less than an entrance to an interior world that may exist inside our Earth, containing its own sun, its own population, its uh, unique flora and fauna, perhaps even a more advanced civilization that exists on the surface. 
And as for this theory of there being a sun inside of this earth, how how did people come up with that conclusion? You know, uh, it is part of the hollow earth model initially was an idea that there were concentric spheres. So the earth was made up of kind of a like a nesting doll, smaller circles within it, you know. Uh, over time, the idea developed that it was a, a large, empty eggshell kind of development. Uh, as more and more information was kind of brought out, especially around the time of Latsky and Theosophy, which kind of contributes to this stuff in a little bit uh, in regard with like uh, kind of the population of who lives down there. Are they these kind of uh, spirit guides, ascended masters of Theosophy? who are said to live in an enchanted city called Agartha, where the king of the world, Sanat Kumara, reigns over the hollow earth, woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, crystal cities, you know, really far-fetched stuff, but, uh, but fantastic. And I, I, I think it all goes back to a lot of the fiction that existed around that time period. You know, you had Donnelly in the Antediluvian world, Journey to the Center of the Earth, the Time Machine. These kind of ideas around the turn of the century, uh, as far as kind of developing science fiction, uh, you know, they were new, they were fresh. But nonetheless, they were part of the zeitgeist. So that uh, a lot of the Hollow Earth model comes from turn of the century science fiction, to be absolutely honest. I like the theory. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, uh, if you, you know, have forced me to choose between a disc shaped earth and a hollow one, I'm always going to go hollow every time because it's more fun. It's, it's a funner story, you know, uh, but, of course <laughs> you got like a little paradise inside of the planet and, and exactly. we're going to talk into that just a little bit, <clears throat> but I want to say hello to all of the people joining the stream. I'm seeing a lot of new names. So welcome. Um, <laughs> but what's uh, what's interesting about this topic? It is a fun topic. Now I do not subscribe to the theory because it's uh, it's it's an interesting one, but not one that I necessarily subscribe to. But what I did find interesting while doing the research for today's show was that according to <clears throat> international studies, scientists have found a three times larger reservoir than all of the oceans on Earth's core. A zone of water exists between the upper and lower mantles of the Earth. And this has been, um, these findings have been stated in Scientific America, among others that have looked into this. And it's like, okay, well, with something like this, with this little piece of information, is it possible? maybe for some people to go ahead and believe that sure but i think that regardless on the topic or not that was a piece of information that i didn't know anything about yeah it's, it's cool. pretty wild it's absolutely wild the you know the thing with the hollow earth and and as fun as i think it is uh, i used to argue with people whether or not it's a, a there's honeycombs within the earth where maybe vast caverns exist where perhaps you could see cities, maybe the eggshell model isn't the appropriate one. Uh, but there's so many fun hollow earth stories. The Shaver Mysteries, that's a great one if you guys want to look into that ever. Uh, oh, can you, know, you tell this... us? Oh, Please. yeah, absolutely. The Shaver Mysteries. So uh, Richard Shaver was uh, a man who claimed he spent eight years trapped in the inner earth. Uh, as far as his story went, there were great alien races that came to the planet in ancient times called the Atlans and the Titans. They developed vast technology across the face of the Earth. And then they created an advanced, like, organic robot called the Abandoned Arrow. Then the Atlans and the Titans leave Earth completely, leaving all their technology and the Abandoned Arrow behind. These Abandoned Arrow retreat into the Earth during a cataclysm and diverge into two distinct species, the Dero, who are detrimental robots, Dero, who fight a never ending battle against the evil Dero under the earth. Uh, so Richard Shaver says he spent eight years down there uh, among the extraterrestrial technology. He had a family with the Tarot. He had a Tarot wife. He, uh, 
had spent some time kidnapped Arrow, but had escaped, uh, which is very rare uh, from my understanding. People generally don't escape from the detrimental robots down there. Uh, but he did escape and made it back to the surface world to tell his tale, uh, which he wrote in a 10,000 word uh, letter to Ray Palmer, who published, uh, I think, Astonishing Tales magazine or something like that back in the 40s. That's a long uh, but, letter. Yeah, it's just a pretty long letter. But uh, it's very likely he spent those eight years in a mental institution. Jeez. It, it just, that story <laughs> it took me on a roller coaster. Okay. <laughs> um, Rolo, thank you so much. It says, Christina, great, great topic and great guest. All oh, thank of Pete's, you so much. All of Pete's social media links are in the description box below. His YouTube channel is called Creepy Little Book, where he covers stories like this so many times a week. So go ahead and check it out. Um, but before we move on, um, talking about the hollow earth while we're still on this topic you even have the nazis going to antarctica and allegedly doing some you know some investigations and some research there as well does that have from your understanding and from the rumors that have been spread because there really isn't too much information regarding that does it were they looking for the entrance to the hollow earth or was it something else entirely some say they were looking for the answers to Hollow Earth. Others say it had more to do with whaling roots and whale oil at the time, uh, which I could buy into a little more. Uh, the fanciful aspect of it gets almost to the borderline of, like, sketchy stuff where, uh, you know, uh, there's some that believe that there are still Germans down there. Uh, they call them the last battalion. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're the base, I think it was number 211, base 211 in New Schwabenland, Antarctica. Can you say that um, one more time? Yeah, base 211 or 311. It's 2 or 311, something like that. In New Schwabenland, Queen Mouds Land, Antarctica. That's what I wanted to hear. It just sounds like a very interesting word that I, I feel like if you were to look at it, you'd be like, what the heck am I reading? But it just, it just <laughs> sounds... Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think they showed up and they named it after the boat that they were on. Nice. From my understanding. But uh, whether they were down there looking for the hollow earth or whaling roots, you know, they had made a claim to land in Antarctica at the time. Uh, there is uh, some weird stuff that occurred with Operation High Jump, where after the war, uh, a contingency of U.S. military was sent to Antarctica, led by Admiral Richard Byrd. And uh, they kind of got whooped down there and came back with planes shot down and boats sunk. Something happened down there. So perhaps there was a contingency of ships that they went into battle with. You know, uh, I hope the good guys won at the end of the day. But, uh, you know, uh, who knows the truth about whatever occurred there? Well, according to the Hollow Earth Research Society in Canada, they believe that the Nazis are still there, like you had mentioned. And after the war, the organization claims that the Allies discovered that more than 2,000 scientists from Germany and Italy had vanished, along with almost a million people to go to Antarctica. Does that sound far-fetched to you? Or are you like, it's, it's, it's possible? It's possible. Uh you kind of get into a little bit of Operation Paperclip territory there, where a lot of those scientists were recruited to come over here and work for NASA. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like they were recruiting those scientists to come over here to work for us. So if some escaped, they may have gone to places like Argentina. I don't know how established Antarctica actually was. Is there an underground base there? Did they have time to dig something like that out? Was there a pre-existing cavern that was refurbished? You know, is there some kind of German city under the ice? Uh, I highly doubt it. But that is part of the Antarctica mythology. Yes, and it seems like, and this is just a rumor once again, but when Admiral Byrd had went to Antarctica for Operation High Jump, he had a diary. Mm -hmm. And now we don't have that diary anymore. No. 
supposedly. But there were statements that were placed there that Berg believed that he entered um, a like a, a cavern to get into the hollow earth where he was able to see a totally different environment when he entered even like a different civilized like a, a civilization there were humanoid looking entities there is that correct that's absolutely correct you know uh, they guided his ship into the hollow earth they took control of it that's pretty wild now what's interesting Flynn. which is so bizarre what's interesting about this particular character, Admiral Byrd, is that he was awarded the Medal Honor, which is the highest recognition of achievement for heroism in the United States and the greatest military honor. So with an achievement like that, it makes you question, would this guy lie? Or mm -hmm. we, we can take a step back altogether. Did he even ever have a diary? Did he even ever say this? Well, we, we unfortunately, he is not with us, so we cannot ask him these questions. But from the little information that we have, once again, rumors, and, and you look at this achievement that he had received from the American government, it makes you question, you know, if he did write a diary, if he did get this award, okay, you know what? It's a little bit more like I can sink my teeth into that a little bit more slightly right yeah i think admiral bird was a credible witness uh you know unfortunately we don't have the diary there's snippets that have kind of leaked over time where and claims that's where about it's sketch pete ufos yeah it, it is it is kind of sketch so you know it's like i say all the time on my channel i don't believe in 85 percent of this stuff it's the 15 percent i do believe in that's bananas there you go. But even if we don't believe in it, or if we do, these are still interesting topics to cover. Oh, yeah. They're still important because in a sense, rumors are not fake or not. It's still valuable for the topics that we research. We still need to be familiar with it Absolutely. so that we can guide people in the right direction if they're looking into this and they're like, oh, this is totally real. And you're like, well, let me give you the information that I have. And then you can make your own conclusion on you if go. you want to believe it or not. But we need to cover these stories. Oh, I don't disagree at all. Thank you. But another kind of um, weird topic, and one, and I'll be honest with you, Pete, one that I wasn't too familiar with was the ice wall. Now, this oh, is for wall. those that are more familiar with the flat earth theory and i will be so straightforward i know nothing about it so when i was doing the research and i would like to mention that um pete sent me a few bill of points like we're going to cover these and i'm like okay i'm ready i'm doing the research and i'm like <laughs> the ice wall what does this mean i'm doing research and i'm like oh my gosh flat earth and you know yeah. what we got to cover it and I it's was part of surprised. it it's part of it you know uh so uh essentially the idea that there is no antarctica it doesn't exist at all. There's nothing down there but a massive two-mile-high ice wall that encompasses the whole of the Earth, and that's what keeps the oceans from falling out. Jeez. Let me, uh, let me share this image right here. That's a pretty good one. There you go. Yeah, the ice wall. Yeah, so for this topic of flat Earth, from your knowledge, do you know how this theory started it's biblical it's a lot of this stuff is biblical i made a flat earth video years ago i actually had to take off of youtube because i just swear for about two minutes uh just debunking the flat earth and i i and like i say in the video i could have done a lot of well thought research about how i could debunk the flat earth but instead i just kind of rant and rave and swear at the viewer for two minutes about how ridiculous the flat earth is uh but flat earth like i say in that video if you think the earth is flat because of the Bible, then you know less about the Bible than you do about the shape of the earth. Okay. So uh, the idea is biblically that the earth would be flat. That was an understanding based on uh, 6,000 years ago, nomadic peoples who lived in Mesopotamia. That's fine. You know, that was their understanding of, of the underworld, the heavens and the earth. That's, that's kind of how they rationalize things. Now, we also know, was it Epicurus who discovered the uh, circumference of the Earth in, like, 500 B.C.? So, uh, it wasn't like people didn't know the world was round at some point. 
but the flat earth model comes directly from biblical belief. Uh, I, I find it very hard to find a flat earth proponent who can separate the biblical stuff from their scientific stuff. But uh, the ice wall is supposed to be there. And a crazy theory, one of the craziest parts about the flat model is the puddle earth theory. Have you heard of this one? No. So Tell essentially, me about it. instead of space being out there beyond the ice wall, it's just infinite ice. Uh-huh. And on the other side of that ice could very well be other puddles that contain oceans and continents. So when we think we're dealing with extraterrestrials that come from another planet, we could be dealing with something that comes from another one of these puddles. Mm. Over I, the it, ice it's, wall. It's, it's, it's so crazy to me because I'm so big into astrophysics and like the search for exoplanets right. and that the very notion of a flat earth is just crazy for me but the but an ice wall okay you know if if it is there could it be down to something else and if so what that is the great question what uh what is on the other side of the ice wall you know what you know how far down does it go is there right. go, is there any going under the ice wall you know but if 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 this model is accurate if we're all wrong if everything we know about space is wrong, then Antarctica doesn't exist and there is an ice wall. But I, I find it to be a little far-fetched personally. I think there's, you know, we, we, we live in an infinite, vast universe. And if our planet was flat, that would indicate that every other planet was flat too. And, and we have footage of these planets, you know. I know people will argue whether or not the validity of the footage is in question but prior to a lot of the composites you know they did have photographs that came back in the 70s from some of these planets and uh they're round you know why would earth be the only flat one right that that just it's illogical altogether yeah. that every other planet and exoplanet can be but earth cannot be it's like um logic no but <laughs> yeah <laughs> talking about drilling into ice ice walls Let's kind of, while we're on this subject, let's talk about Lake Vostok. Oh, yeah. This Vostok. is a cool story, totally alleged, but one that belongs in one of Lovecraft's stories. They've been drilling ice cores out of that lake for years. For years, they've been pulling up all kinds of stuff. Um, I've always worried that they might pull up something ancient and microbial that could become a problem for us. Mm. But uh, that's what they've been doing, drilling. That That's right. And to talk about um, kind of contaminating either the water there, because this lake has been frozen for, what, about a million years or so? About. And so uh, everything there is pristine under, uh, I believe it's about, what, uh, a mile? A uh, hundred? No. About a mile under under the ice to get to this lake, give or take a little bit. But NASA went ahead back in 1999, approved funding for the development of a torpedo-like probe dubbed CryptoBot. And it was equipped with a heated tip. And the probe was designed to slowly melt its way down through the glacier, unwinding communication cables as it went. And as CryptoBot ventured down, the water would refreeze behind and remove it above it which is really impressive then before it breached the ceiling of the lake the probe would then decontaminate itself with a hydrogen peroxide bath and once inside a crypto bot would release the remote controlled hydro boat a specially designed submersible vehicle equipped with a camera and other instruments to explore the interior of the lake now this took place back in 1999 and it sounds like what they would need to see on uh, what they would need to use on Europa when yeah. we eventually send a probe there or even Gadamede as well, a crypto bot. But this um, with this kind of invention, to my knowledge, it was a little bit later afterward that there were Russian expeditions that went to this lake doing very similar research and they came across a creature. 
Are you talking about Organism 46B? I am. Okay, yeah, the shape-shifting octopus creature <laughs> yeah. that could look like the scuba divers it was attacking. Yeah, I I distinctly recall Organism 46B. That was a very strange cryptid story that came out of Antarctica. Very few people know there are supposed cryptids on Antarctica. Uh, Organism 46B gets a lot of the attention, but the Ninjen of Japan, another one. They're kind of like whales with legs. What? What? Yeah, yeah, they're like big white things with, with, with legs. Some of them have arms, and they're like mer people. Uh, they are said to range from like 13 feet in height to the Zimus creatures. Yeah, they're like humanoids of Antarctica. The word actually means human in Japanese. Jeez. No, that, that, that's a new cryptid to me. Never heard of that one. Yeah, I, a, I barely even one. heard of Organism 46B. Yeah, Organism 46B, they say they captured that one. That's right, by Dr. Anton Padelka. Padelka? I believe is how you say it. And now, he was with a group of scientists, but he was the only one that came out about the story and then very quickly fleed Russia. Mm -hmm. See, this is where the story gets sketched. He doesn't have any evidence to back up his claims, which are extreme. And I will let you explain uh, what he encountered, he and his teammates. But then he very quickly left Russia, and now you can't find him. Even today, like, tracking this man is is uh, almost impossible. But tell us, what did he find when he went on this expedition? And what happened to his to some of his crew members? So they found this uh, this you know, for lack of a better term, this octopus that could shapeshift its form. And uh, I believe there were six divers on the team. Uh, and uh, this thing took them all out. Whatever it was, was able to shapeshift not only into an octopus, but into uh, the form of the divers themselves, creating even more confusion in the water. So, uh, so this thing took them all out. They, they were essentially able to capture it after the loss of at least six lives, from my recollection, uh, and then bring it back to Russia. I, I heard some speculation around that time period that the doctor in question may have stolen a sample of the creature prior to absconding Russia. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how true that was. Well, that could have been just a little tack on at the end of the story. You know? <laughs> Maybe to make it sound more believable, make it sound more awesome, because yeah. th this does, like Area 51 had mentioned, Cthulhu, because this this kind of story belongs in one of Lovecraft's masterpieces because it's so weird. And it's believed that this creature had 14 arms instead of the usual eight, right, from an octopus, mm -hmm. and it could shapeshift. And like, like any octopus, it could seize its prey. But what's interesting about the stories attached to this cryptid, because again, it is a cryptid. We do not know if it exists or not, but that it would almost, it would almost use telepathy on, on its victims um, as well, which is like very unique um, for an octopus, but not so unique for a cryptid. We've, we've heard a few cryptids yeah. that can do this um, across the globe. Uh, one example is being Bigfoot, another one being a Mothman, you know, things, cryptids like that. But having an octopus type entity do that, as I've said so many times, the ocean is monster soup. Now, this took place in a <laughs> lake, and there is no exception there. Monster soup. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the water myself. I don't mess with the ocean. It's, uh, it's I find uh, open water is a scary thing, and uh, I'm not. I don't mess with riptides either. I'm not trying to get sucked out there because I'm playing on the beach. I am totally with you on that. If I cannot touch the floor, it's okay. I'm just gonna go back to the surface. Get, get, <laughs> right hit hit the shore you. over there. Yeah, right, right. Or I would definitely need a floaty with me just to feel safe. But you never know; it could pop, and then that's it. It's the end of the world for you. <laughs> No, I, I'm not too fond of, of the water. I, I do know how to swim. I've been in a lot of water type environments, but no, uh, the, the ocean, it's, it's mm. not my friend. No. I do like seaweed, though. That is delicious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that comes from the ocean. So, uh, you know, it's good. But coming, coming across this story, when you were doing the research for Antarctica originally, and you came across this uh, encounter, 
what were you thinking when you were reading when you're reading this? Uh, I just think any kind of story involving a life form on that continent is fascinating, especially when we're talking about cryptozoological life forms. Uh, it's just fuel for the furnace for me, you know, like I just I love it. Can't get enough of it. So uh, the more cryptids that can come out of the frozen continent, the better. You know, like I, I think it's pretty cool. Now, I don't believe everything I hear, but I think it's fun. I, I am with you on that one. And for those listening, for those that are researchers, never believe what you hear. Do your own research. Ask you your it. own questions. Because just because they might sound credible, just because they might have some fancy title, it does not always mean that they're right. You got to ask the questions. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've been at this for eight years now. And I'll tell you, my opinions on some of these things have radically altered after doing the research into them. So stuff that I used to believe, I can't even wrap my head around anymore. And things that I once thought were fake, I, I'll buy into whole cloth now. But uh, I advise everybody always to make up your own mind. And, and that's one of my goals behind my channel was to present the information for your evaluation. Yeah, and that's how it should be with any channel or any person sharing their research is to not push your opinion onto your audience or those listening, but to provide the information and allow them to come up with their own conclusions. That's the best thing you can do. And I am so grateful that you do that with your audience. We do it here on this oh, channel yeah, as, it as well. It's well. great. Thank you. So we have one more topic to cover to finish our top five, and that is an ancient Martian city could yeah. be in Antarctica. Now, uh, the ancient Martian city stuff is a lot of fun. Uh, I first came across this because somebody started emailing me tips about Antarctica, and it was very clandestine and, and exciting uh, but they were the first person to suggest to me there was a discovery of an ancient city down there left by extraterrestrials or ancient humans. The more I researched into the possibility, I came across something called the Hefferlin Manuscript that spoke about seven cities that existed down in Antarctica, the greatest of all being Rainbow City. <clears throat> now, what made these cities unique is they were made of a type of plastic, which is incredible for a claim made in 1935. Okay, yeah. You know, uh, there was also mention of UFOs in these claims of the Hefferlin Manus well long before Mount Rainier sightings and Roswell. So uh, they even accused the aforementioned Richard Shaver of stealing elements of their story for his underground world claims. So the Hefferlin Manuscript is uh, it's definitely something worth looking into if you're a researcher and you're interested in Antarctica. Uh, it's very brief. They never released the full thing. It was like a pamphlet they were, you know, kind of handed out in the 40s. Uh, it was a, a married couple, the Hefferlins, that worked on this together. Now, I don't know how true it is, but for those claims to have been made back then are pretty fanciful. The flying devices, the, the city uh, in the ice... Uh, they claim that there were still extraterrestrials living there, specifically Martians. Uh, there would be other researchers who are less credible than even the Hefferlins who make claims about bird aliens down there and, uh, you know, uh, the involvement of these kind of avian aliens with our governments and our world leaders, and uh, and I think that's a little more far-fetched. I like the older claims more than the newer ones. I feel like a lot of the newer ones have been cooked up whole cloth, whereas uh, some of the older pre-contact D stuff is fascinating. And can you kind of give us a comparison between the older stories and the more recent ones? Why do you believe the older ones compared to the ones that just kind of surfaced? Well, I think the older ones, when, when it comes down to it, to make claims about seeing a UFO in the 50s and 60s could have ruined your life. So imagine what it's like in the 1930s and 40s to come forward and say, hey, uh, not only have I seen a UFO prior to everybody else in the world ever hearing of what a UFO is, but there's a secret city down in Antarctica. Uh, now, of course, Lovecraft had already existed, so the idea of 
that as was probably out of the zeitgeist. And Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story about Antarctica too, where there was a sphinx present in the ice. Oh, can can you tell us a story, please, if you're familiar with it? Uh, the you know the title escapes me. It's it's rather long. Let me see if I can find it here. It's like the story of J. A. Pym of Nantucket or something like that. Yeah, Edgar Allan Poe. I remember listening to that in uh, high school, and I really enjoyed his poems. Just the style that he used, and it's very dark and uh, depressing, but it is very interesting. But I wasn't oh, familiar yeah. with this one until doing the research for today's show, and I, I just like barely read the um, that he wrote a poem about it, but I didn't actually see what he wrote regarding Antarctica. And then you brought it up, and I'm like, now I have to ask Pete. I gotta ask the question. The narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. And he writes of an exploration to Antarctica where they uncover a sphinx. Uh, I, I believe it's a redemption tale for the for the main character. I haven't read it in a very, very long time. No, totally understandable. No, I, I, I get that. But looking at this Martian city, um, we, we heard stories about it in the 40s and a little bit, you know, onward after that. But what led them to that conclusion? Okay, so there's some belief that Mars suffered a great catastrophe in the ancient past and that refugees from Mars came to a once lush and tropical Antarctica about two million years ago. These would have been referred to by some as the pre-Adamites existing before Adam and Eve and before the biblical Garden of Eden ever did. So, uh, so these creatures come to Earth and they set up a a city somewhere in Antarctica when it's still a jungle. Uh, it kind of goes in line with the seven cities of the Hefferland manuscript, but I think it's a little more rational that there was one city created at the time period uh, we're talking about. If there were such refugees that came from Mars, maybe from the Cydonia region where we see this Martian face and the Martian pyramids, you know, I was always fascinated by what Mars may have been in the ancient past. And uh, I don't think it's too far-fetched to think at once it may have been a developed civilization uh, millions and millions of years ago. So if they did have to take refuge somewhere else, their sister planet here, the Earth, would probably be the most likely candidate. And, I mean, look uh, at it. It's so nice. Yeah, I mean, so many different climate zones. Yeah. So many resources. Uh, I mean, it's an alien's dream. It's It's almost like... You know, when you watch science fiction, you'll see stuff like Star Wars, where an entire world is a desert. Or Dune, for example. Great example. Uh, Arrakis. Whole world's a desert. Or even in our, our, our own solar system, we have uh, planets that may or may not be entirely covered by oceans. And mm -hmm. moons that may entirely be covered by oceans. But for our planet to be so unique, to have all these different climates and uh, resources on it, maybe it is some kind of experiment. Maybe it is some kind of preserve, you know? And these are the fun questions to ask ourselves yeah. and to do the research for because that's what makes it – life so much more interesting where you can use that imagination and you can ask those questions outside of the box john aside thank you so much for supporting the channel it says great fun show ramen fun hashtag ramen wagon thank you so much and we that's all the time that we have for today covering the top five rumors of antarctica pete where can people find you online you can check me out right on youtube here uh, i am the creepy little book uh everywhere on all my socials as well. I'm also on a few alt tech platforms, but I consider myself the master of mysteries and the antiquary of the arcane. I cover everything from the extraterrestrial to the esoteric, from the spiritual to the supernatural, and all that lies between. And I invite you to come onto my channel, check out my back library. It's in a vast catalog of evergreen videos concerning the esoteric and the extraterrestrial. And join me for my live streams, where we get into all kinds of fun topics. And talking about tracksuits. Tracksuits, that's right. There you go. And go. His, I, I placed his link in the live chat. It's also Thank in the you. description box below. Pete, I'm going to put you backstage, okay? Okay. All right. What a fun topic. It is always a blast talking to Pete and hearing his insights when it comes to any topic that he's familiar with. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the thumbs up before you head out if you're watching this live or on a replay. Once again, 
A new track was just released on my space ambient music channel called Cosmic Portals. And this new track is called Dune vibes also come over to the discord server where you can continue this conversation in the after show chat on thursday at 2 30 p.m pst is mysteries with the history with jimmy church of faded black radio so make sure to watch that live and then on friday is weekly strange news at 3 p.m pst where i'll be covering all the strange news and mysterious headlines from around the world and that will also be live. That is it for today. I'll see you on Thursday. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.